Before I begin, let me uh, take a moment to thank the organizers who uh, invited me to speak. It's a great honor to be here. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking to you about a recently published genome editing technique that I developed. Um, it was recently published in the Journal of Genetics in November 2014. And so this is available to the wider community, and also how we're using some of this, uh, how we're using this, uh, this genome editing technique as enabling technology to do recombinatorial uh, fungal metabolic engineering uh, in a partnership with JGI and their DNA synthesis program. So um, I'm sure many people in the room have heard of genome engineering because it's a very hot topic currently, um, with the current poster child being the Cas9 system which, in short, uses a, an RNA molecule to target an enuclease activity at a locus of interest to generate a double-stranded break. This double-stranded break then is a natural uh, site of recruitment for DNA repair enzymes, which can either abolish gene function via the NHEJ pathway, uh, shown here on the left, or on the right, um, uh, be able to insert uh, new sequences of interest by a homologous recombination. Um, so this is, uh, this is the current gold standard, but previous technology uh, is still being used, such as talons, which uh, were notorious for their uh, difficulty to engineer, though much easier than many things. Um, but the same basic idea still applies, making a double-stranded break, and then having that recruit repair, temp, uh, repair enzymes to that locus of interest. Now, in Saccharomyces cerevisiae, there's been forms of genome editing happening in uh, that species for, by some accounts, 20 to 30 years. And a lot of that early genomic engineering was done with the Euro 3 system and what is called uh, the uh, delete then replace method. <clears throat> so here is a cartoon of a genomic region of interest with a gene of interest uh, outlined here in green. So what, what the uh, Euro 3 based system of delete then replace involved was taking the Euro 3 allele, or sorry, the Euro 3 gene, and using it to knock out your gene of interest and select for that replacement. Uh, on media that lacked uracil. Cells with ura 3 are able to actually synthesize uh, uracil, and so they're able to grow in this minimal media. Then, once this intermediate strain is recovered here on ura 3 media, uh, the, re the uh, transformation is repeated, this time trying to replace the ura 3 allele with sequence that you actually cared about. And this could be selected for on, uh, or counter-selected, if you will, on a drug called 5 fluorouric acid, or FOA media. Um, the end result is that your gene of interest is replaced. Very little to no uh, effect has been had on the sequences that surround it, but this comes at a cost, and the cost is that to do this technique, your strain has to first be ura 3 minus. You have to remove the native ura 3 gene and use a copy from a different species. It's also relatively inefficient and time-consuming because the, your, the, your uh, rate of transformation of Saccharomyces cerevisiae approximates the same order, of, uh, it's approximately the same order of magnitude as the spontaneous deactivating mutation rate of ura 3. So the end result is that an experimenter would actually wind up having to wade through a bunch of false positives, and nobody likes to do that. Right? No one likes to do that? Sure. Um, okay, so in 2011, I started my postdoc with uh, Chris Hittinger at the University of Wisconsin, pictured here, and many of the questions that we were asking, and many of the, the, the things that we wanted to do relied on working with wild strains of Saccharomyces yeast, not just Cerevisia, but other uh, species of the Saccharomyces genus, and all of these were prototrophs. So we wanted a genome editing tool that was like Euro 3, but, but well, we didn't want to make prototrophs because that could be difficult with some of these species uh, and time consuming for very little uh, reward. So we decided, that we, we had a list of things that we needed, that we wanted a tool to do. We wanted it to be functional in prototrophs. Uh, we wanted to have a, select, uh, a selectable phenotype that equated to uh, a successful edit in our genome, right? The same way that you can select for your three's removal and replacement, we wanted something like that. We also wanted it to be, it to be highly efficient because who doesn't want your technique to be highly efficient, right? Um, and so once we had our list of stuff uh, down, we re I realized that we were looking at a genetic, uh, sorry, a genome editing device that contained two separate parts. The first part was a broadly functional positive and negative selectable marker, and the second part, a uh, inducible double-strand break generator, as that latter component had been shown in a wide variety of organisms to uh, dramatically increase your transformation efficiency. So I went about tackling the first part, the, the positive and negative selectable marker, 
And the gene I chose to pursue was thymidine kinase because of a very interesting fact about it that I'll get to in a second. Thymidine kinase, is, its gene activity is pretty simple. It functions in nucleotide salvage to phosphorylate the nucleoside thymine, uh, thymine which then is able to be used uh, in DNA synthesis, which is this reaction right here. Now, the interesting part is that all fungal organisms lack that gene. Uh, it appears that this was lost sometime shortly after the, the, the common fungal ancestor and the common animal ancestor split off. So this was a long, long, long time ago. Uh, so what that meant is that thymine kinase, if I could get it to function in uh, one fungus, there's a possibility it could function in many fungi. So this was the gene that I chose to pursue, and I was able to actually come up with a selectable and a counter-selectable drug reg uh, regimen that functioned in yeast. Uh, for the selectable regimen, I found that a class of drugs called antifolates were able to deactivate native thymine synthesis in yeast, and then I was able to rescue cells that contained thymine kinase by putting thymine in their media. So as you can see here, the drug kills the cells without thymidine kinase being driven by a high copy marker, while the cells that do have it uh, are able to survive. Then uh, the counter-selectable system was much simpler because uh, this gene had actually been used as a counter-selectable marker in fungi for many years at this point, uh, and the drug Fooder, 5-fluorodeoxyuridine, was, uh, this is an, a, a thymidine analog, and this was actually proved to be quite toxic to yeast, even without a transporter. So you can see here, cells with thymidine kinase die quite readily when they're placed on food or media. So I had a positive and I had a negative selectable uh, selection system set up. I went to actually go and try this by deleting the AD2 gene in Saccharomyces cerevisiae and replacing it with uh, the uh, AD2 gene from Saccharomyces uvarum, which are two, uh, the two most distant relatives of the Saccharomyces species. And the reason that I chose that was because you can easily see a new varum sequence in cerevisia because of the high divergence. So it, it rules out contamination. And very much just like the Euro 3 system, I deleted the native copy with thymidine kinase and then replaced thymidine kinase with the Saccharomyces uvarum at 2 sequence by selecting on food or media. And I, all this, uh, the, uh, the, I obtained many of these, uh, of these clones contained the uh, Saccharomyces uvarum sequence. Though I did have a lot of false positives as expected. Um, so now that I had a, a, a positive and negative selectable marker available, uh, I went about uh, finding a good double-stranded brake generator. And the one I chose was one that was, um, had been fairly well characterized in the Saccharomyces cerevisiae system for a long time, which is just the meganuclease ski one attached to a galactose-inducible promoter. Uh, and then uh, this meganuclease has a recognition sequence that was artificially placed on the opposite side of the promoter itself. Uh, and this is a very simple system. When uh, cells containing this part are grown on glucose, uh, expression of SKE1 is uh, actively repressed, and thus no double strand break is being formed because the meganuclease is not being expressed. However, when placed on glucose, or I'm sorry, galactose, then uh, the SKE1 protein is expressed, and double strand breaks are formed by meganuclease action. So, like I said, this has been well characterized, and so I just took this part from some previously existing uh, components that we had lying on the lab, and I fused it to the thymidine kinase marker I had already characterized to form uh, the herp cassettes, herp 1.0 in particular. Um, so then, now that I had this tool, this seemed like something that would actually fulfill our needs. Uh, and so to characterize it, I repeated my ADD2 experiment where I deleted ADD2, but this time with the herp cassette itself, and then induced the double-stranded break formation after I had inserted the, the cassette and replaced it with Saccharomyces uvarum ADD2. What I found is that uh, that double-stranded break really does work when it comes to, uh, comes to uh, affecting your efficiency. I wound up getting efficiencies of between 0.25 and 1% of surviving cells in a pool. What this translates into, that sounds really low, what this translate, translates into is that a single transformation reaction can generate 200,000 to all the way up to half a million individual transformants per reaction. Right? That's so many transformants that I, I'd have to dilute these out by uh, 1,000 or 10,000 times, otherwise I wind up with a huge lawn on my plates. Right? So that's pretty, that's pretty efficient. Uh, and all of the uh, fooder colonies 
that were, that were uh, obtained and sequenced and screened contain the actual edit. So it's a highly effective mechanism as well as being efficient. So uh, this is all documented again, and like I said, this has been published in Genetics in uh, November 2014. And it also, um, in there, I don't have time to talk about these applications, but a couple of applications include uh, pool transformations where you can use this, this technique to generate populations of cells that vary at a single locus of your choice uh, with, uh, by transforming with pools of PCR products. And you can also manipulate both loci of either chromosome of a diploid simultaneously with one transformation. So that's all in there. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. Uh, and I'll be glad to talk your ear off. So how does, this, how does this tie into JGI and the DNA synthesis program? Well, uh, so I'm part of the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center at, at, at uh, UW-Madison. And what the, uh, I'm, I'm particularly part of the conversion area, which is the area that is, that is um, research is how to get yeast to and other microorganisms convert hydrolysate into, into useful fuel. And so what we're working with is Aphex lysate, which has a lot of glucose, a little bit of xylose, and then a bunch of lignin. Now to yeast, yeast love glucose, right? They absolutely adore it. They don't even see xylose unless they're engineered to see it, and lignotoxins kill them pretty badly. So the two big overarching questions of the, uh, the conversion area of GLBRC is how do we get yeast to use xylose more, and how do we get them to resist the toxicity of their uh, hydrolysate better. Um, so to address these, uh, these uh, two main points of, of uh, the center, or of the area, uh, we have entered into a collaboration with the DNA synthesis uh, program in JGI to develop what, are called, what we call the yeast biodesign cassettes. Well, these consist of um, some, uh, a promoter terminator pair, uh, let me start again. So there's 250 of these cassettes that we designed. They each consist of a, ter a promoter terminator pair of genes that we know or, or that we highly suspect of being um, constitutively active in hydrolysate. So they are always on, even under stress. And uh, a number of different genes that address the two main points. Uh, use xylose better and resist toxins better. And then some bells and whistles that I really can't get into right now, but uh, the, they're supposed to be able to uh, allow us to do multiple edits on the fly and enable the recombina uh, recombina recombination using a LOXP and Crebay system. So the idea is to take these cassettes, and uh, I developed what, are, what I'm calling the color linker system, which is just a fancy name for a bunch of oligos uh, that I ordered, that tag the ends of each of these cassettes with uh, 40 base pairs of sequence identity to other cassettes in, in an effort to actually do this, which is to piece them all together in a big pathway, the herb cassette will then be used to actually drop these into a locus of interest and generate uh, stably integrated pathways that we can then recombine later on. So this hasn't been done yet, though we, uh, the plan is to actually have this done by the end of the summer. We just got our last plate of uh, synthesized material from JGI, so everyone's really excited to actually get this going. And we actually, I have personally tested one of the constructs already, and it seemed to increase xylose consumption by 150%, though that's a very preliminary uh, result, but I'm very excited to get home and actually continue working on that. So um, thanks to, uh, here on the left, the Hittinger lab, including my advisor who is here and in, in the back, hi boss, um, and all my lab mates. Uh, in the middle, these are people that provided materials that uh, grace, uh, very uh, graciously provided materials for us, and also, uh, my beta testers for the Herp cassette, who got to watch it fail many times before I got it right. And then the biodesign team, which consists of uh, folks from both UW and also here at the JGI. So thank you very much. Any quick questions? So what is the, it sounds like the rate you're getting for, for cuts is pretty low. Oh, actually, no. Um, it, I mean, it's 1%, so that's pretty high of, of the entire population. Okay. Um, the, uh, it, 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 the real issue is that once you start getting cuts, then the, the current limiting factor is not the actual, the, the break, but it's actually getting DNA across the membrane. And so uh, I've been trying to avoid doing spheroplasty for a while, though I might have to actually do that to get some really super high uh, transformation rates. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you.